All right, you nasty Gundarks, fall in. You all know and love the drill. This is Attack of the Rhetoric, the spot where we discuss, among other things, culture, psychology, and government in the Star Wars universe. Today's war-torn topic is the rise and fall of the Galactic Republic through mercantilism and militancy. In Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, we see the Senate of the Galactic Republic on the verge of panic at being totally unprepared for the outbreak of a civil war, leaving some people to wonder just how the Galactic Republic had managed to soldier on for roughly a thousand years without an army to call its own. How is that even possible? How can civilization persist without a military? Without a standing army, how will you be able to handle humanitarian agendas, or guarantee a balance of power, carry out policing actions, or liberate indigenous populations from domestic despotism? And that's not all. What about hostile neighbors, invading barbarians, encirclement, insurgencies, terrorist attacks? Without a military, how are you going to mutually assure destruction? You. Need. An army! Bearing in mind how little is actually said about the Old Republic within the films, I would like to offer an alternative example. But in order to do this, I was forced to make three very reasonable assumptions. One, the Republic was formed through the use of a military, and the military persisted for decades or centuries after the inception of the Republic. Two, there is no recognizable large-scale threat beyond the Republic. Three, the majority of planets cannot maintain their current level of technology and culture without a complicated network of interplanetary trade. Corset maker, excise officer, and inventor of the United States, Thomas Paine jots down in The Rights of Man, when all the governments shall be established on the representative system, nations will become acquainted, and the animosities and prejudices will cease. Once the Republic was well established and there were no more protracted battles to fight, the army would have become stagnant and eventually atrophied. No longer conquering new territories, and therefore no more bounty or plunder flowing into the military, the standing army would have become too costly to maintain. Of course, there would be considerable downsizing, however, long before the army was totally disbanded. Payne continues, Give them, the soldiers, their discharge. Cease recruiting, rather than retain such multitudes in a condition useless to society and themselves. We see a clear historical example of this at the turning point of the Roman Republic as it was being reorganized into an empire. Considering the similarities between the name Palpatine and the Palatine Hill, center of ancient Rome, these parallels are not likely coincidental. Indeed, sci-fi gargantuan Isaac Asimov asserts that the nucleus of the Star Wars mythos is a direct imitation of his own Foundation trilogy. Asimov remarks, I certainly imitated Edward Gibbon, so I can scarcely object if someone imitates me. Edward Gibbon being the author of the important and authoritative masterwork, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. That's not to say the army would simply disappear Far, far from. I'm not implying that the Republic was so benevolent as to not require the threat of force in certain circumstances. If the units of the army are to be made up of the divergent races spread across the galaxies, it is reasonable that those units would be best cared for and maintained on the planets of their origin. There would be a structure similar to bastard feudalism, wherein each planetary system upon entrance into the Republic would pledge either military might or the funds by which military might might be purchased. This relies on the principle that full-scale war is a relatively rare occurrence in the Republic, say every thousand years or so. But why would war be so rare? Father of modern metaphysics Immanuel Kant proposes six steps to be taken by a League of Nations in his 1795 essay, Perpetual Peace. Step three insists standing armies shall in time be totally abolished. Heck, even the quintessential general Sun Tzu knew that battle and bloodshed were not the only nor the best solutions. Attaining 100 victories in 100 battles is not the pinnacle of excellence, 
Subjugating the enemy's army without fighting is the true pinnacle of excellence. As renowned Prussian general and military theorist Karl von Clausewitz famously stated, war is the continuation of politics by other means. They presume there is an army by which indirect pressure can achieve favorable circumstances. Yet, there are forces besides an army which may exert enough pressure. It is reasonable that the state of technology the galaxy enjoys is not the result of any one particular planet, but rather the conglomeration of various resources and know-how from various planetary systems. This is most evident on Tatooine, Hoth, Kamino, and especially Coruscant. In regards to natural resources, Thomas Paine writes in Common Sense, where nature hath given one, she has withheld the other. The necessity of commerce would create a web of interdependency that would not easily nor willingly be broken. Each planet or federation of planets would know that cutting itself off from the whole would be disastrous. An aggressor would be subject to trade restrictions imposed on it by all other systems. In the landmark and seminal work Utopia, Sir Thomas More writes how this is a very effective form of persuasion. So long as no bodily harm is done, their anger goes no further than cutting off trade relations with that nation till restitution is made. They think they have really acted with manly virtue when they have won a victory such as no animal except man could have won, a victory achieved by strength of understanding. The Utopians were not above going to war, and they had an army, but they considered its use only in the gravest of situations. They preferred to undermine the enemy violently, but not militantly. They know very well that for large enough sums of money, the enemy soldiers can themselves be bought or set at odds with one another, either secretly or openly. These grave situations can be avoided. Payne writes, Peace with trade is preferable to war without it. Our plan is commerce, and that, well attended to, will secure us the peace and friendship of all. Trade will always be a protection. If commerce were permitted to act to the universal extent it is capable, it would extirpate the system of war. The planets, having developed a long history of trade and friendship, being dependent on the entire republic to coordinate commerce, would be reluctant to act aggressively. Indeed, in a democracy, there would be no need for interplanetary combat, and therefore no need for a federal army. No man can assign the least pretense for his fears on any other grounds that such as are truly childish and ridiculous that one colony will be striving for superiority over another. Perfect equality affords no temptation. In Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift writes of a nation that knows nothing of foreigners or external threats, yet still maintains an army, but an army much depleted and of little consequence. If that can be called an army, which is made up of tradesmen in the several cities and farmers in the country, whose commanders are only the nobility and gentry, without pay or reward. This reflects a modified feudalism that can operate effectively without an external threat. The only reasons for fighting are nobility often contending for power, the people for liberty, and the king for absolute dominion. As there is no king in the Galactic Republic, and the people are already free, the only danger is the nobility, or dukedoms, which should be checked by their own greed. Pain once again. In military numbers, the ancients far exceeded the moderns. For trade being the consequence of population, men become too much absorbed thereby to attend to anything else. Commerce diminishes the spirit both of patriotism and military defense. The more men have to lose, the less willing are they to venture. Trade emerges as the single most important unifying factor in the Republic. But inevitably there will be violent outbreaks that require direct and overpowering force to contain. We see that the Naboo, for example, have a security force of volunteers. But what if even they should fail? That's where the Jedi come in, the guardians of peace and justice. In Episode 5 of Attack of the Rhetoric, I have already compared the Jedi to the Guardians in Plato's Republic. Well, here is a further comparison. 
their function being to see that the friends at home shall not wish, nor foes abroad, be able to harm our state, their function being to assist the rulers in the execution of their decisions. Imagine a warrior that possesses the ability to call upon the force of all living things in the universe to influence a situation to his or her advantage. One Jedi would be a warrior worth a thousand. As a group, they would be an unsurmountable deterrent that would totally, utterly, in times of peace, replace an army. So, from a certain point of view, the Jedi destroyed the army. So, it's ironic that the army destroys the Jedi. Darth Sidious, in a stroke of genius, struck directly at the heart of galactic unity, the Trade Federation. The disruption of trade leads to the impoverishment of certain systems. Impoverishment leads to disenfranchisement in a very literal sense. This, in turn, causes sedition. When the dependency on trade failed to protect this network of systems, the Senate should have stepped in and taken decisive action. Unfortunately, recently elected Chancellor Palpatine was actively working to subvert the democratic system and allowing the seeds of discontent to grow amid the cracks in the facade. Once commerce became unreliable, secret alliances were made until a significant percentage of systems were able to set up their own economy and present a stable threat to the Republic. But why the Republic was unable to save itself, I have already talked about in Episode 5 of Attack of the Rhetoric. Most definitely, it is unrealistic for a society to thrive without a military, but I hope I've presented a plausible alternative. All I ask is that anyone who criticizes Star Wars for daring to conceive of such a society, keep in mind that they're also criticizing a long list of well-respected intellects. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching. Dismissed.